what is the future of human communication? Where are we going? And technology is helping us right now, but are we just replacing ourselves with technology? One day, people won't even need translation companies. One day, we'll all have one of these. Oops. <laughs> you look skeptical. Sir, I am fluent in six million forms of communication. <laughs> six million forms of communication. Well, okay, maybe not. But so I am from a language bank, as he uh, mentioned, and we're based in New York City, and I'm the general manager there. And our company is, uh, we do translation, we do interpretation, we do um, audio and video localization and different types of cultural consulting. And I personally have loved languages my whole life. You mentioned uh, one background, but the truth is I've actually enjoyed and loved languages and linguistics my entire life. Um, I've been studying both since I was a little kid. And when I was 11 years old, I started studying linguistics. When I was 12, I started studying Spanish and Japanese. And when I was 13, I decided that I was going to go to university for linguistics, and that's exactly what I did. And there's one term that I'm going to use today, uh, that is, which is SME, and it's in your handouts for everyone who has one. And basically that term is, I know some people know SME as subject matter expert, but I'm going to be using that term to refer to small and mid-sized enterprise. And uh, in this case, particularly small and mid-sized LSP, it's just an abbreviation I can use. So the translation industry wants to make text available to everyone. And the goal here is not actually translation. It's communication, right? We're trying to make sure that uh, we can communicate with everyone easily uh, all around the world, right? With no barriers. Communication is really just a transfer of thought and ideas. And not all communication even needs to involve words. Uh, in fact, Communication may not even need text at all. Communication could be thoughts or emotions. Uh, some examples could be dance, theater, or even pantomime. Now, we are starting what I consider a content transformation revolution. What I mean by that is that um, it's not about translation, it's not about interpretation, and in fact, it's not even about technology, it's about content. We all talk about content, we know about content, but what we're really seeing coming up is that content is uh, being the way that we move content around and the way that content uh, leaves one person and arrives at another person and how it's being transferred is really changing a lot uh, these days. So I know that's a little bit of an exaggeration to say revolution. The truth is we always talk about you know, this is revolutionizing the industry and it's, it's true, revolutions are nice and slow, but I think that we're at the beginning of a long process of this shift in uh, the way content is actually handled. And what I mean by that is the transformation is not the transformation to change, the transformation is changing content. Google already allows us to browse based off of reading level and that has nothing to do with translation or language. What they're doing is they let you search by basic, intermediate, or advanced levels of reading. So the content that you can search for or look for is really just a degree of difficulty, if you will. And what that means is that it's really about letting people search for content or find content in a format that they want or that works for them. Uh, and this is actually not a new idea. There's plenty of organizations who are considering this idea of just content uh, being moved around um, in everyday life. Uh, there's an organization with the EU called MetaNet uh, that they have 54 research centers in 33 countries and their whole purpose is to try to find ways to use technology to make, uh, to allow people to access information more quickly and more easily in everyday life. So it's not even about translation industry, it's just daily life access to information across languages. And the professional trainer Mark Profit actually said uh, he has a, a methodology called predictive innovation, which one aspect of that is the technology hype cycle. And what that is, is first a technology is released, a new technology, and it's trying to solve a problem. Then the market gets a taste, they get an idea, oh, we like this technology, it sounds great, but eventually they realize it's not perfect, it has problems. So then the technology 
uh, the market demands more. They want it to be better. So they finally, they ask for more. The technology company has to then turn around and improve upon it, release a new update. And it just keeps going in a circle and improving in this technology cycle until um, you reach the perfect solution that you were trying to solve in the first place. Of course, if you ever reach that perfect solution. And we all get those software updates all the time, so I think we're familiar with that. A perfect example of this is machine translation. You know, it keeps improving, we keep getting better at it, and the market sees it and they say, this is great, I love it, and then eventually they get used to it and they say, but it's not perfect and we want it better, so we keep trying to improve it. But really all technology, according to Mark Profit, all technology does this. By the way, I love that name, Mark Profit. It's a great last name. Um, now the old fear was, is machine translation going to replace translators? And we're kind of past that. I think most of us in this room are beyond that. Uh, but then we also questioned, is machine translation ever going to be perfect? People keep questioning that and wondering where we're going with machine translation. But you know, the dirty little secret is human translation isn't perfect. So does it really matter? The question here is not whether or not machine translation will be perfect. The question is, do our users care? And so what's going to happen in the near future? Well, obviously, we're going to continue to see commoditization of uh, localization and our rates. And you can't really fight it, unfortunately, for now, at least. Uh, we just kind of have to accept it. And there are ways to try to deal with it. But the commoditization is going to continue. Um, and this is pretty evident, actually. If you look at, we kind of did it to ourselves. If you look at some of the, the processes that we're using that have caused this um, with general purpose machine translation like uh, Google Translate and Bing and even processes like uh, crowdsourcing. These things have really taught our clients that machine trans uh, that uh, translation itself is cheap. They see that, they think it's cheap. Oh, why is your, why are your rate so high? You know, use, just use machine translation. And in fact, not only that, but the general public uses the same things like Google Translate and Bing, and they think, well, machine tra uh, translation should be free. So we're basically teaching the market that it should be cheap. And that's one of the reasons, uh, one of the things we're fighting with this commoditization. Another thing that uh, is already happening, and it's going to just uh, continue to happen quite a bit, is technology integration. And what I mean by technology integration is all different kinds of technology coming together, different pieces coming together to uh, work together to create a, uh, to solve a bigger problem. So lots and lots of different te uh, technologies. And that includes inside and outside of our industry with this integration. And data storage is moving more and more into the cloud. And data processing is moving more and more into the cloud. And we're accessing the cloud uh, through mobile devices more and more. So content is all moving to this cloud-based data processing, cloud processing. Um, and one of the, the strange effects that we're seeing with that as these new technologies come in to support that is uh, even something as simple as intelligent search. And what I mean by intelligent search is uh, like Apple's Siri. For those of you who are familiar, it's, you know, this, uh, you use your cell phone, you go to Siri, and you just ask your phone, you ask Siri a question like, uh, where is there a good Japanese restaurant around here? Well, Siri uses the keywords from what you say, and then it, along with the GPS technology, geolocation, and it does a search to find the information that you need. It might pull up an app that's relevant based on your keywords. It might go and get the information and then tell you the information. But what we see is also with Siri is that when, for example, if you're looking for that Japanese restaurant, well, it's going to go to um, you know websites directly to websites like Yelp or uh, menu type websites or restaurant review websites or even Foursquare, and looking for what rating people have given ratings as a good restaurant, so it can find something to uh, to give you the answer from based off of that information. The key here is that it never actually went to a search engine. So as it's looking for the information, looking for mobile content to return back to you, it never went through a search engine. It never went to Google or Yahoo or Yandex or anything. So what about all of the search engine optimization from those, web, those restaurants and those companies? It's not nearly as effective. If we continue to use more and more of this intelligent search, then search engine optimization doesn't have quite as much impact, and you have to find new ways to market your product in the digital era. But one major thing that we're seeing that's a change is actually a shift of who is demanding our services. The shift is actually moving away from clients to our users. And for who's demanding the service. 
we're, we're actually, most of, the, most of the growth in the industry is being motivated not by the client side, but by the user side. The users are telling us what they want, what they need, and clients, as our clients as well as technology companies are trying to meet those needs. And it's always, to the, uh, it's always been the case a bit where, you know, our clients are just servicing their uh, users, but the general population is really the one driving the force behind a lot of the new uh, technologies and this automation that we're seeing. Everything is really based off of what they want. Google Translate is the perfect example. They got a taste of it. Now they want a lot more. Now we're trying to put it in everything. And this also leads, though, to a change, a shift in who determines quality. Before, uh, I mean, the, the users actually de decide whether or not they want uh, perfect translation, whether they want um, you know, good enough gist translation, something in the middle. It's, our clients are basing off of what they're telling them and it's really now, the quality is not defined by either uh, an LSP telling the client, oh yeah, yeah, we reviewed this, it's perfect, trust us, or even the client having an in-house reviewer who looks at it, okay, yeah, it's perfect. It's not the client, it's not the, the uh, LSP, it's really the users who are kind of calling the shots when it comes to quality these days. But we're also seeing a shift of when translation happens. And this is actually uh, more interesting to me. Because imagine, the, imagine a, a company, one of your clients, they have a file, they built a file in English, and they need it translated in seven languages. So they send it out to an LSP, the LSP translate this into the seven languages, returns it, they say, great, it's done. Now the client is going to publish this content in eight languages and any one of their users can now access this content in the eight languages and read it, or anyone who reads those eight languages, right? So they were determining that they were going to do the translation at the time of distribution of content or when they sent it out. But now there's a lot of these technologies that are allowing people to translate when they receive content. In other words, if your client has some type of technology, whether it's a customized MT or something more general, depending on its, its usability or need, if they just know that their users can receive the content only in English, click a button, translate me, you know, translate this chat, translate this document, or whatever, and it serves the purpose, if they can just use some technology to translate that content when they receive it, well, they never needed to send it to the translation company, and you just lost that work. So this technology could be replacing you in certain situations. But the point here is that the translation now is not happening before it was sent out. It wasn't a decision by the client. It could be a decision made by the receiver, and we obviously see that. We've already been seeing that in some areas. Uh, the classic example is uh, what we're seeing now with the MT featureization, as it's being referred to, where you, you kind of have that extra feature on, on certain technologies to use MT. Facebook, they have the translate this chat, translate this comment or whatever. Uh, it's running, uh, being translate uh, inside of Facebook in order to do that. Uh, granted, it's you know, not great. You know, we all know it's not really good quality but yet, but at the same time, it goes back to that idea of the, the tech cycle. The public sees it, they love the idea, they know it's not perfect and now they're asking for more. So we've kind of let the cat out of the bag and so we've got to follow through on what we've been saying we can do. But this wasn't exactly new. I mean, if you look back, CompuServe actually was using Sistran in 1994 to try to uh, apply machine translation to their chat rooms. So this idea of machine translation for social communication actually goes back quite a ways. Uh, in fact, um, the futurist, uh, Ray Kurzweil, said these kinds these things kind of sneak up on us. By the time they are revolutionary, they've been around actually for 20 years. And basically what he's saying is, tomorrow's revolution is really some yesterday's project for somebody. I know you're all thinking, but he hasn't answered the question. Is technology replacing small and mid-sized LSPs in the translation supply chain? Maybe. It's like everything else, it depends. So let's take a look at the supply chain. This is basic, a basic, very simplified supply chain where you've got the end users, the clients, uh, language service providers and the linguists, even the technology companies. And yes, I did separate the small and mid-sized LSPs, the SMEs, from the large uh, S uh, LSPs. 
And the reason I did that is uh, for a few reasons. One is that um, some of the technologies that are currently possibly threatening the SMEs are actually technologies that l the large LSPs are using, selling, or offering as one of their services. So they have the, the, the money and the time to invest in some of these technologies, and they can offer automated translation as a service on the side. So they've kind of covered both sides. Um, and some examples of that, uh, obviously, are things like uh, LionBridge's GeoFluent, um, SDL's uh, Easy Translator, and uh, B Global. And of course, we also see down there the, in the red the TEP, uh, which has been around forever. And you know, there was a great session uh, earlier about that. And it's uh, the old you know, translation, edit, proofread model. And more recently, we've got the MTPE, or machine translation with post-editing. And some people call it post-edited machine translation. But the, um, so that, that those are the two models that we're kind of seeing uh, right now as things are starting to shift. So what's the effect of this, uh, of some of these changes on the supply chain though? Well, some technology companies say that, uh, when I say technology company, it could be a website or someone who's offering a new technology to, uh, your, to the market. And some of these companies or websites say that they can offer very cheap, very quick translation. And the way they do it is that they're saving the client money by getting rid of that expensive, wasteful process of project management. Well, they even say that it's professional. They're not claiming that it's machine translation. They say it's totally professional. Um, and there are plenty of companies out there that we've seen, you know, One, one Hour Translate, uh, MyDjango, uh, Web Translated, B-Words, CloudWords. These are all, you know, examples. And there's plenty more, and I'm sure we'll see a lot more coming. But there's a lot of venture capital being invested in these areas, so we, we obviously have to take it very seriously. I mean, CloudWords uh, has received over $3 million in the past two years. Uh, My Django has $5 million. And in less than two years, a company called SmartLink has already had $14 million invested in it. And these are just a few, but that's a lot of money that people are putting into this because it sounds like a great idea. Now, we can all sit around here and discuss how valid these uh, companies and websites are and whether or not they're actually going to be able to do what they say. Um, but the truth is it doesn't matter, because they're taking your clients right now. And the linguists couldn't uh, do anything to stop machine translation from coming, and you can't do anything to stop these companies from coming. The trick is we have to move past it, and we'll get to that in a minute. But if you look, you notice that all of those websites that I've been talking about, they connect the clients to the linguists, so they're still using human translators, human, human translation. Whether it's TEP or MTPE, they're claiming they can go around the LSPs by going through this, what they call automated process, to speed it up and to save money, but it's still human translation. And they make it sound so easy, but what we need to do is, of course, tell our clients why they need LSPs. The obvious answer here is to educate the clients on what is um, the value of project management itself. You know, we're always trying to look for our unique selling proposition, and unfortunately, this is an old uh, value that we had to defend, but now we're going to have to redefend it, this idea of what is it that project management saves. And one of the things I also noticed is that the websites all claim, you know, don't spend a lot of time and money going to an LSP, wasteful project management. A lot of them say that. But then they'll say, all you have to do is log in, create an account, uh, upload your files, upload your TM, clean your TM, prep your files, go through our database of thousands of linguists, pick the right ones, uh, the right vendors, send them the paperwork, then coordinate with them, receive the file, review it check to make sure that it's okay, let the linguist know that it's done and that the job is approved and finished, and close out your job. Look, no project management at all. <laughs> Sounds a lot like project management to me. So the question is, do your, uh, what do your clients really care about? Because maybe they would rather save a lot of time instead of a, a little money, right? And again, we said it's still TEP or MTP. It's still human translation. And most of the new volume, the growth in the industry that's going to require translation is going to be at these levels that are for fully automated translation. Uh, that's where really the, the exponential growth is going to come from. And this is not new, and there have been plenty of people who are talking about this. It's part of that data deluge that we always talk about that MT is trying to help us solve, because humans just can't do it all. So all, a lot of these technologies, though, the technology companies, technology websites, there are plenty of those that are also going after the fully automated. The ones I just described were trying to take away from the top, the, the, the human translation, TEP, MTP. So those are the ones you really have to fight. The ones that are trying to do fully automated, 
that's not really your market most of the time. So you don't have to worry about following the, the trick or competing against those. The point is, choose your battles. Know who it is you're competing against. There's plenty of really interesting technologies that are out there. Um, and one is WordLens, if you've ever seen it, uh, you know, point it at, a, at something in another language and it'll, it will immediately translate it into the other language and it sounds great and the public sees it. If you watch the YouTube videos, it looks absolutely amazing. Of course, it only works in Spanish and English and the MT's not that great, but whatever. You know, again, the market has seen it, they think it's a great idea, they're just starting to realize it's not perfect and they're going to want more. So we're putting out these ideas and technology cycle goes on. Another one is we have... Here we go. So then there's also these phone interpretation systems where you can have one person on the phone talking in one language and it gets picked up by voice recognition, which turns it into machine translation. It goes through, spits out text to speech uh, software, which then says what you said, but in another language. You're both, two people can be having a conversation, but neither one of you is speaking the same language. And you say a language and you hear your own language back, but you're speaking two different languages. Uh, and there's a company in Japan, NTT Dokomo, that's doing this very well. Um, there's Lexifone. Um, there's Microsoft is actually has a whole research department working on this so it, it's kind of an interesting new technology again lots of problems still needs to be developed but at the same time the idea is there and fortunately this one is not out in the public and the markets not asking for it yet but it will be soon also we have, uh, you know, th those were examples of machine interpretation, which by the way, I, five years ago, I remember we were joking in the office, we'll never see machine interpretation, but here we are. And there are households all over the world that have these connect for Xbox, those uh, boxes that read your body movement in open space and then can follow that. And it's very much, it was released all over the world. It's very popular. It's, it's very much a game system. It's used for games everywhere. But why can't we use this for sign language? So why can't you have one of these machines reading, if, of course it would have to improve a little, but you could have it read hand gestures and movements, and then it could convert that, those movements into sign language notation. There are actually quite a few sign language notation systems, written sign language. Have that machine translated to a different language, text to speech, and then it speaks, and next thing you know, you have machine interpretation for sign language. So that's a possibility. Granted, that doesn't exist at all, I just kind of made that up, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see that someday. And, but the thing is, is that the market is dividing in new ways. So what we have is that uh, in the early days, long ago, it seemed like, you know, when uh, we were starting to provide our services, globalization hit and everybody needed to start translating everything and the prices started to go up because we were very valuable. We could raise our price, but then the market matured and eventually the economy went down and commoditization hit and so uh, prices started to drop again and that's where we still are. But what we're, where we're at now at the beginning of experimentation, we're experimenting with lots of new technologies and ways to apply uh, different types of services. It's really expanding much more than it was. And so the main thing is that we, we kind of confused about which services go with which needs and it's confusion from the clients, confusion from the market, and we're kind of all chasing after the same thing, but we're all doing different things. And the, one of the things we need to do is kind of once it settles uh, and we'll, we'll kind of go in our own, uh, go our own route, the idea is that we need to help the clients and the market really, and that's users, clients, to kind of understand which services go with them and we need to figure out what we really do. And it's picking and choosing who your individual market is. It's, you know, finding your, your niche market. But once we help them learn and everybody pairs off and matches, then what this will probably do is you'll end up with the bulk of the data is going to be this automated stuff at the bottom that's free or cheap. And then as you go through more elite stuff, it's going to rise. Most of the daily content is going to be uh, translated by automated software, all of this uh, social stuff and the, the low risk stuff. But people are going to see that more and more and more incorporated in everyday software and their everyday lives. And they're also going to then realize that that translation is not great. And as they learn what its limitations are and what it can and can't do, they're going to start to appreciate the, the high quality translation that we can provide with humans. So essentially, as the services split, so will the market and so will pricing. And they'll start to appreciate that high quality translation that we spend all our time on and we'll actually be able to charge more. So in other words, eventually, won't MT and technology integration really just lead to the decommoditization of translation? Of course, we have to get there first. And 
let's think about how this industry industry is splitting. The old assumption is that uh, the industry is splitting between uh, TEP and MTPE. You know, MT is is shattering the industry, but we've had MTV MT uh, for a while, and it really hasn't shattered anything. And the truth is, is what's really happening, I think, is that the the separation is going to be the difference between fully automated translation versus what I'm calling human touch. And all I mean by that is any type of translation or localization that involves uh, humans. It could be uh, TEP, it could be MTPE, it could just be automated translation but with subject matter expert review, QA or something. Anywhere where there's a human working along that workflow process, uh, it'll slow it down and it's not fully automated. So. What this does is that some tech companies actually, these technology companies or websites or new automated technologies, I'm sorry, new automated technologies, there are really multiple pieces of uh, technology that are being combined, like we said, with all this integration. So one option you could have is to become a specialist with one of these pieces or part of that supply chain. If you can't invest in the entire process, maybe you become a specialist with helping build empty engines or clean empty engines, and or maybe you help become a specialist with the, the voice to speech. We're going to see a lot more with voice uh, interpretation back and forth. But I mean, those are some options if we see this big data deluge. But the truth is, most of us are going to stay on the human touch side, dealing with some aspect of human translation, right? That human process. And what we're also going to see with the data deluge is a whole lot more need and crossover between localization industry and text analytics and data mining. We've heard that a bit, at, the, at least I've heard that a bit at the conference already, but it's true. We're going to, we have too much content we don't know what to deal with, so, or how to filter through it all. We can't get to it, so we're going to uh, see more interaction. And some LSPs are on the, uh, some of the SMEs, the large LSPs, some of the large LSPs are also on the fully automated side, but that's, again, we mentioned that they can actually afford to invest in that. And one of the things we really need to do is just really go back to educating the client again about the differences between fully automated and human translation. Once we get through that education, then we'll be able to move uh, past to uh, the differentiation, people understanding uh, where the market is breaking up and uh, the different kinds of translation. They'll appreciate it as more, as I said. Um, really what you want to do, I think, is as we see more data and content uh, and need moving towards fully automated translation, the what you want to try to focus on, I think, is finding where are the best places to continue using human translation. Where is human touch translation going to continue and will not be threatened by fully automated? And that is obviously places with high quality standards. Um, LSPs should probably specialize in certain industries or fields to maintain an advantage. And, you know, I would say don't be, I think. There's so many companies out there that are a one-stop shop and we say we do everything and we love to say that. It's very common. But I, I think the future is specialization. And what we need to do is really find your niche. And when I say specialization, I don't just mean a specific industry or a specific service. I mean it could be anything that's involved with this technology as part of that chain. It could be a, an industry but even a technology within an industry because it's just going to keep growing and subdividing more and more and more. So you need to really find where there's a specific need that you can be great at but it, you need to uh, understand how you're going to uh, fit into either the technology side, the automated side, or the human touch side, and you can stand out. Um, LSPs love to call themselves that full service agency, but as we all know, full service agency really kind of means I'll take anything. And it's especially important if you're going to build the empty engines, like I said, where you know it, it, it's a lot of investment of time and money to build a machine translation engine. So if you want to return on that investment and you really want to be able to focus, if, you, if you're doing every industry and every client and every type of work, then it, it's just not affordable to, to apply MT to your, your process across your company. And MT, even within human touch, I think is the future. So I think you're going to need to specialize because once you start applying MT into your workflow somehow, you can't do everything and use MT. It's just not feasible for smaller companies. Um, stick with things that are involve uh, high stakes, accuracy, confidentiality and security, uh, things with craftsmanship and artisanship like marketing. These are areas that clients probably don't want to trust to just automated technology and computers or they don't want to put their data in the cloud. So where are we all going with this? Technology is continuing to merge together. Uh, we're continuing to put all the pieces together uh, of the, the technologies. And we're continuing to see that, that tech cycle circling. But imagine a few things. Possibly, you know, we take translation memory, machine translation, uh, 
throw in voice recognition software and intelligent search, and you can actually deal with communication that is both verbal and nonverbal, right? Maybe you, the computers can start to learn context of what we're saying with our words. Or you don't even need words. You could have, uh, like we said, with the connect box, a computer could scan and read our body movement and our facial features through facial recognition software. And we already know what some of these expressions mean as humans. We could program that. And next thing you know, a computer can listen to you, look at you, and watch you and know that maybe you mean more than you say. Or maybe the computer knows when you're lying. Um, so the historian Nicholas Osler uh, said that MT is going to be the new lingua franca. Maybe. But uh, we're definitely shifting towards interacting as humans more and more with each other through technology more and more. I mean, phone, email, text message, IM, chat, social media, etc. And I mean, I have friends who will call each other up on the phone just to get them right away and say, hey, text me. <laughs> and then I'll have a conversation on text for like an hour. Well, you were just on the phone. I don't get that. But so is technology becoming the middleman for uh, all human interaction? You know, you'd say, well, no, that's ridiculous. Technology isn't going to completely be the middleman for our human interaction. But, you know, uh, technology is cold and distant. Human interaction is, is uh, you know, intimate and personal. Well, you know, everyone, a lot of people had computers 20 years ago. And who knew 20 years ago that today there'd be so many people having sex with computers? So. <laughs> Now, and IBM is even working on computer systems using uh, scientists for informatics, uh, infomatics, who can uh, use technology to read brain waves and know what those brain waves mean so you can think and control computers. It started with, you know, uh, prosthetic limbs where you could think and control and move an arm, but why would we stop with limbs? You know, why don't we just think about this computer and that system and that machine and with everyday technology, and then we think and control a machine, controls a computer, which talks to a computer, which talks to a computer, and who knows? So maybe we are moving towards interacting through computers. So that's all just fantasy, but the main point is that, uh, you know, content is continuing to merge, technology is merging, they're trying to solve bigger problems, and we're going to be dealing with these massive kind of connections of uh, technology that are managing content and putting, putting uh, content transformation as a background feature. It's not going to be a, you know, as much of a surface feature. And it's fully automated translation is really growing exponentially. So we can't be afraid of these new uh, things that are coming out that we hear about that are fully automated translation. Really focus on the ones that are trying to take away your business in human translation or any type of human touch translation and find how you stand out. The big one is going to be uh, the separation with uh, project management. But um, really do us all a favor and if you find those industries that still need project management, that, 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 that we have a value.